Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about adoption and Prophet Muhammad's marriage to Zainab. To begin, the five, to the five topics I want to discuss, how Prophet Muhammad married Zainab and how adoption got abolished, ancient cultures and adoption, difficulties with adopting in Islam, why did Prophet Muhammad marry his daughter-in-law, did Muhammad fall in love with Zainab and how adoption became, became forbidden with Zaid and Zainab. The first topic is ancient cultures and adoption. Looking at history, we know adoption was a common practice in many cultures. It's something good to do, you know, adopting someone is like making them your son or daughter, they become part of your family, they take your name, they inherit from you, they become, you know, they become part of the family. Um, there's many examples, you know, ancient uh, Roman culture, elite Romans used to adopt, a fam adopt children and they became part of the family. Sometimes the, the adopted son would even have a higher status than the natural born son. This is because the, the adopted son was chosen, you know, whereas the, the natural son was just born with however he was, right? Eh? Uh, a very famous example is Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. They had a child and, and, and Julius also had an adopted son. Guess, became, guess who became the next leader of the Roman Empire? The adopted son. The adopted son became Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire. This is because he was adopted by Julius and he was given, he was given the, the empire. So, I mean, this is kind of amazing that this is, the, this is how, you know, in ancient culture, adopted sons and daughters were treated. They were treated like their own child, you know? And they would they would get everything that the that the parent would have the customers, the respect, the privilege, the family name. You know they were given the honor of being like an actual child. In fact, like um, Julius Caesar, his son became the next. His adopted son became the emperor, not his natural son. The same thing in pre-Islamic Arabia. You know sometimes pre-Islamic Arabia jahiliya, the period of ignorance as it's called is sometimes looked down upon, but there was many good things in pre-Islamic Arabia. For example, Tabari mentions, Tabari, that in accordance with the Arabic custom of adoption at the time, Zayd ibn Haritha was thereafter known as Zayd ibn Muhammad and was a freed man, regarded socially and legally as Muhammad's son. So before Islamic law changed with, with the marriage of Zainab and Prophet Muhammad, Adoption was a very normal process in pre-Islamic Arabia, so much so that they would take the name of, you know, Zaid was actually called Zaid, the son of Muhammad. Muhammad actually adopted him and he took his name, his family name. Now, why did this all change? We'll get to that. I want to talk about practically difficulties with adoption in Islam. Yusra Goma, in an article titled, Why Adoption and Fostering Must Be Our Muslim Duty, in April 2016, wrote, so, so basically she was writing an article about adoption in Islam and how difficult it is. She, she, she did some interviews and research and she, and she says, When I asked whether Muslim children frequently came into the system, the adoption system, she was told that they did, but they were amongst the most difficult children to match into homes because of their unique religious and cultural needs. I made similar inquiries in Michigan, Washington, Indiana, and Wisconsin only to hear the same response, that it was, they were the most difficult children to match. It's very hard to, for a Muslim family to adopt, and, and let's discuss why. The first reason is because of mahram issues. Mahram is basically the laws of blood, meaning when you're mahram to someone, you're allowed to be alone with them. You can hug them, kiss them, like, you know, you're mahram to your mother, you're mahram to your father. You know, you can basically, you can basically be alone with them. They're like family members and you cannot marry your, your mahram. The thing is, when you, when you adopt, that child is not mahram to you. So if you adopt a girl, like if I adopted a daughter, I wouldn't be able to be alone with her. I wouldn't be able, I can actually marry her, right? It's not considered an actual adoption because adoption is not allowed. So what would happen is that girl would just be a part of the family, but she would kind of be like a stranger in the family. As well, 
how can you get around this? I actually know, you know, one individual who wanted to adopt a child, uh, a fa one family. And so what they did was, in order to adopt this little boy, they, they, the, the mom tried to, I mean, like the adopted mom tried to take some, you know, some sort of herbal medicines to try to get some breast milk so they could feed the baby because you can become a foster mom in Islam and then the, the child would be a mahram to you. Um, this, because this didn't actually work, the, the actual, the second option they did was to get, get her sister to breastfeed the child. Even though the child was, you know, done breastfeeding and, you know, obviously it was a foster child that was being adopted, by, by her sister breastfeeding, it became kind of like a relative and, you know, she became like an auntie to the child. So this is kind of like the workarounds you have to go through in order to have an actual child in your family that's related to you or so-called related to you, right? And you can imagine how difficult this is and how, how problematic it is. And so many Muslims, they don't want to because when a child grows up, how what would they do, right? And they don't always have these workarounds available, right? Uh, really strange that you have to do this. As well, the adopted son or daughter doesn't take the name of the family, the family name. The adopted son has to be known as this, this child has his own name. And we'll get to the story of how this happened. But basically, this is a very serious thing in Islam. So serious that... Um, as that it's it's punishable by hell. Um, I'm going to read a hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. It was narrated from Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, that he heard the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, say, there is no man who will knowingly calls himself after someone other than his father, but he has committed kufr, disbelief. Whoever claims to belong to people of whom he has no ties of blood, let him take his place in hell. This is a very serious point. I mean, taking a child, giving a child your name, it's, it's, it's strangely serious, it's very strange, you know, that a child cannot take your family name. Um, adopted son or daughter does not get inheritance, that's another thing. The rules of inheritance is, are fixed in the Quran, that this person gets this much, this person gets this much, a son gets, you know, one, one amount and a daughter would get, you know, half of what the son gets. But the adopted child would not get anything. Now, there is one third allowance that you can be flexible with. So you would have to specify that from the one third, give my adopted son this amount. Otherwise, the adopted child would not get any inheritance from the family, which is again, quite a sad thing. Compare this to the pre-Islamic, you know, method that the child would inherit would be, basically would be like an actual child. Does it seem like Islam actually raised, raised the rights, increased the rights of an adopted children? No, it actually took away rights that, that they had before Islam. And um, many Muslims are not aware that this, this whole thing actually happened because of, the, because of Prophet Muhammad wanting to marry Zainab. Now, why did Prophet Muhammad marry his daughter-in-law? This was something that was considered taboo, forbidden in pre-Islamic society. Um, so much so that Prophet Muhammad was scared to tell people that he was going to marry Zainab. It says in the Quran, in chapter 33, verse 37, And you fear the people, while Allah has more light that you fear Him. Meaning, Prophet Muhammad was scared about this. He was scared to do this, but he wanted to do it. Zaid was like, was was just like Muhammad's son. Zaid was his adopted son and he was part of the family. He loved Prophet Muhammad very much so and Prophet Muhammad loved Zaid very much as well. In fact, Zaid is the only one mentioned, one, the only companion mentioned by name in the Quran. He has that highest status and that much love Prophet Muhammad had for him. Um, so Prophet Muhammad got Zaid married to Zainab. The, the marriage lasted less than two years. They had some troubles. She was an attractive long, young lady of the, of the tribe of Quraysh. Aisha said, from amongst the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, Zainab was my peer in beauty and in love that she received from the Prophet. This is narrated in Bukhari. So it was well known she was a beautiful young lady. They got married around the age of 35. In fact, in fact, the law of hijab was revealed on the on the wedding night of Prophet Muhammad to, to Zainab. So before that, there was no law of hijab. When he married Zainab, the same night, the, the law of hijab was revealed. The story, the story goes that when the idda, the waiting period of Zainab was over, meaning Zaid had divorced Zainab, and they, there was a waiting period in Islam to know whether you know she's pregnant or not. And once the waiting period was over, Zaid went to Zainab and told her that Prophet Muhammad has sent a proposal, a marriage proposal for you. 
Zainab replied, I won't do anything until I talk to my Lord, meaning God. She went to pray, and while she was praying, the Quran was revealed. And then the Messenger of Allah came and entered upon her without any formalities. And this is narrated in Sahih Muslim. So basically, she was praying, she was asking, you know, she was asking God, should I marry him? Maybe she was worried, you know, what would people say about me? You know, what's going to happen if I marry this man who was my adopted, who was my, you know, my, my father-in-law, essentially, right? You know, um, she, was, she was like a daughter to him, right? So she, maybe she was thinking about this. And while she was thinking about this and praying, Prophet Muhammad walked right into her home and said, I'm your husband. It's interesting. Why was there a need for Prophet Muhammad to demonstrate this role of marrying your you know, ex, ex-wife of, of your adopted son. Is this something that really needed demonstrating? Why would you even want to marry your daughter-in-law? I mean, my, my father and my wife, he treats my wife like, he used to treat my wife like his daughter. She was like, you know, he used to call her Betty, like, you know, daughter. It's, it's just weird and strange. Like, why would you want to marry your, your daughter, like your, someone that's like your daughter? To, like, do people do this? Like, is this a common thing? That Allah needed to reveal a verse about this and tell everybody forever and ever? Now, you know, it, it, it said, it, on one, you know, one uh, Islamic site, it says the reason for the revelation of these verses was that Allah wanted to prescribe a law for all believers that adopted sons did not come under the same rulings as real sons in any way and there's nothing wrong with those who wanted to adopt them who had adopted them from marrying their wives after divorce. So basically Allah wanted to ensure that, that all the Muslims would know forever and ever until the day of judgment that if you know one day your, your adopted son has a wife and you know he, had, he, he divorces his wife you can marry her you know just in case you know she might be attractive lady young lady you never know maybe you want to marry her you know and the, what's the best way of showing this for Muhammad to marry his own daughter-in-law was you know attractive young lady so you know what now we know I mean this is this is great I mean this is a great thing you know if ever it happens again now did Muhammad fall in love with Zainab this is an interesting story I always used to think this was a completely you know weak hadith and fabricated story but after looking into it and doing some research I found out that this is actually not this is actually considered a pretty solid story the earliest tafsir Ibn Ishaq doesn't say, didn't unfortunately say men, mention much about the wives of Prophet Muhammad. But the next, the next one that we have, which is Ibn Sa'd, who died in 230 after the Hijra, mentions the story as follows. So Prophet Muhammad went to visit Zaid, and Zaid was at home. So then Zainab answered the door, and 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 she said, you know, Zaid is not here. Why don't you come in? Prophet Muhammad, you know, turned away. And he, he muttered some things. He said some things under his breath and he left. Now when Zaid came back, he um, Zainab mentioned what happened and she said that Prophet Muhammad came and he, Zaid asked her, why didn't you let her in? And uh, she said, I did invite him in, but he, he turned away and he said, Subhanallah, 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 Musarriful Qulub. Go, which basically means, you know, glory to Allah the Great, the one that changes the hearts. So Zaid, he understood what this meant and he said, that Prophet Muhammad had feelings for Zainab, that he was attracted to her. So he immediately, he went to Prophet Muhammad, excuse me, and he said, and he went to, and you know, Zaid had some issues with his marriage to Zainab. It seems like Zainab was not happy marrying Zaid, who was an ex-slave basically, and she wanted someone of higher status. Now the interesting thing is that it seemed that Prophet Muhammad had had liked her from this story, and this was mentioned in Ibn Sa'd. So be, after this happened, Zaid asked for permission to divorce Zainab. He no longer wanted to be married to Zainab. So what did he do? He, he couldn't bear after this to be married to Zainab, and he asked Prophet Muhammad over and over again, can I divorce her? And Prophet Muhammad said, no. And this is where the verse came in, and you fear the people while Allah had more, has more right that you fear Him. So the verse was revealed discussing this. Eventually, Zaid couldn't take it and he divorced Zainab. And then, as you know, Allah revealed the words that Muhammad got you know, married to Zainab. Now, is this an authentic story? Like this, this, the, the, earliest, the earliest reference we have is Ibn Sa'd, in, as I mentioned, um, in 210 after the Hijra, who mentioned this story. And then Muqatil, actually even before that, Muqatil ibn Sulaiman, who was actually the earliest tafsir, even before Ibn Sa'd mentioned this story. This is in 150 after the Hijra. But this story, this um, tafsir is not considered reliable. However, Tabari, who died in 310 
after the Hijra, he's considered the greatest scholar of Tafsir. He's the most orthodox, the most authentic. He's considered the encyclopedia of Tafsirs, the bastion of Sunnah of Sunni Tafsirs. And he mentions this story that, that Prophet Muhammad was, you know, had feelings for Zainab. He mentions this and he narrated this from Ibn Zaid and Qatada, who was a student of Ibn Abbas. Also, other than Tabari, Tafsir Samarqandi, Talabi, Zamalakshi, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, they all mention the same story that, you know, and, and why is this a big problem? The problem is, it's a big problem because it seems that Prophet Muhammad, you know, he had feelings for someone and then, you know what, the next thing that happened was he ended up marrying her and Allah married her to him and it kind of, it seems troubling, you know? It, it's also interesting that in the later centuries, 4th, 5th and 6th centuries, this story became very, very frowned upon. And, you know, Ibn Kathir even says that some of the earlier books have reports we would n rather not mention. And Ibn Hajr, in 800 and, died 852 after Hijra, doesn't even mention this story. Later on, Scholars went even further to say this early story is a complete fabrication and you know it was made by the evil orientalists, you know, like conspiracy theories. And all of this is mentioned by uh Yasil Khadi in his in his Sira lecture that um all of these all of these um these references which I mentioned. So to conclude the story, to conclude this this video. Adoption became forbidden after Prophet Muhammad divorced, uh, after Zayd divorced Zainab, because before that, you know what they used to mention? They used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad, and this was something that was considered completely taboo to marry your adopted son's ex-wife. To marry your basically your marry your daughter-in-law was considered tab was considered taboo because a son was considered like a real son. So in order to 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 make this you know marriage not as you know controversial. Adoption had become forbidden and you were not allowed to call anyone by the name. So in order to marry Zainab, all of this, all, all of the goodness that came from adoption was completely eliminated. I mean, why else would it be that adoption was, was eliminated at this timely point when, when, you know, Prophet Muhammad wanted to marry Zainab? It's interesting that the both of them happened, both of these things happened at the same time. And it's also interesting that, you know, if adoption is forbidden now and, and Muslims cannot adopt or take the name, why go to all of this, you know, why, why, why would Prophet Muhammad even need to show people? I mean, we can't, we can't even adopt anymore. So why would you need to have this big, you know, hoopla about, you know, you just so you should marry her so that, you know, no one would have any trouble, none of the believers would have trouble to, to marry the adopted son's ex-wife. For the final revelation of God to include such a strange thing, it doesn't it seem, doesn't it just seem troubling? Doesn't it seem strange that in the final revelation of sent to mankind that you would need to include such, a, such an obscure role? And, and isn't it troubling that this beautiful young lady that Prophet Muhammad liked, that he had to come up with moral justification to marry her from Allah? That if it wasn't for this, he could never marry her and people would talk bad about him and say that, look at this man, he's marrying his daughter-in-law. I mean, these are just some things to think about. Um, I think I went a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, thank you for watching. Please subscribe and, and uh, to keep up with my other videos. And as well, please check out my other video about uh, Muhammad's um, revelations that he received um, for marrying his other wives. Thank you very much.